Today's video is all about using the right hardware for the job. So we actually learned a couple of years ago, you can check that video up here if you want, that just because you've got a workload that traditionally scales really well with lots of processor cores, like video encoding, doesn't necessarily mean that it will scale infinitely. And we ran into a situation where adding more processing cores to our video encoding server actually resulted in significantly less performance for spending significantly more money. So we actually found that the sweet spot was somewhere in the eight to 10 core range, with frequency actually being far more important than core count beyond that point. Fast forward a couple of years though, and the 6950X 10 core overclocked extreme edition processor that we equipped this thing with is not only no longer the ruler of the roost, it's actually significantly slower than even consumer grade eight core chips that you can buy today for a fraction of the cost. So we're gonna pull this bad boy out, get it dusted off, swap out some hardware and see just how fast we can make her fly. Uh, you guys ready for me to pull down the render server? All good? Sweet, thanks guys. Speaking of all good, LTTstore.com is full of all good cool stuff, like this hoodie, the stealth hoodie is finally in stock. Go check it out, that's LTTstore.com. We're gonna have that linked in the video description. Before we go any further, I feel like I should explain why we need a render server in the first place. You might think, well, if you've got a powerful workstation, surely you can cut together your video, export it and upload it to YouTube, all without sending it out to a separate server for processing. And we could do that, but there are some workflow advantages to doing things the way that we do. So whether we're shooting on our Reds or on our Canon C200s, we take whatever file type that we originally shot, we dump it into our Premiere project, and we set Premiere to use a Cineform timeline. So Cineform is a mezzanine codec that has great performance on the timeline, and it retains a great deal of the image quality from the original file. It also has some other advantages. So compared to codecs that use iframes like H.264, Cineform is much easier to kind of uh, chop pieces out of without having to completely re-render your file. So something that we can do is if we set our timeline to Cineform, render all the files out in Cineform, and then make a change like pulling a sponsor spot out for Flowplane, we can very quickly export two different versions of that video without taking up a bunch of time on the editor's workstation, allowing them to get back to work. Now we could take that finished Cineform file and upload it directly to YouTube. Only problem is, it's anywhere from 30 to 60 gigabytes for the average Linus Tech Tips video, which, even though our internet here is really fast, still takes a long time to upload to YouTube because there are transfer speed limits on their side. So what we need to do then instead is take our Cineform file here, you can see we're remoted into that server right now, and convert it to H.264, which will not only upload faster on YouTube, it will also process faster and more reliably. Here it comes. Oh man, that's heavy. Okay. Oh. All right, let's see how brutal this thing is inside. Ready? Wow, that's actually not that bad. It's almost like dust filters are a really, really good idea. So let's walk through how this thing was configured in the first place. We've got a triple 120 millimeter fan with some of Noctua's industrial PPC fans on it for cooling. It's actually, you can't really tell, but it's, uh, it's lifted about this much off the bottom of the server chassis so that as these fans draw air through the front of the case, these ones suck that cool air up through the radiator and then the warm air kind of gets blown along this way. For our reservoir, we went with a, a, like a metal one because I didn't want any risk of leaking whatsoever. You can see it actually has very little evaporation too, which is really nice. A D5 pump because reliability is absolutely the most important thing in a build like this. And RAID 1 drives, uh, those aren't that reliable of drives. Those are 10 year old Force 120, anyway, it doesn't matter. 
We've got 32 gigs of RAM. This was the stuff we painted actually for a project quite a long time ago. And then I went with a GTX 980. Now, normally you wouldn't need like a gaming graphics card in something like this, but some of the workloads that it handles are CUDA accelerated and we did get a performance improvement from that. So we chucked it in there. So the only things we're really replacing today are gonna be the motherboard, the CPU, and the memory. And then I also grabbed a, an RTX 2080 Ti to see if maybe after we upgrade our CPU, there could be some benefit from a faster GPU. So let's get started. So pretty much every aspect of this is getting an upgrade. We are dropping down from 10 cores to eight cores, but because they're faster ones, I'm still expecting a performance improvement. We're going from 2666 megahertz memory all the way up to 3200 megahertz memory, and that is with lower timings to boot. And we're of course going from this older X99 motherboard to a new Z391. So let's hope that since my last project using this thing, I had to ultimately pull it out of my system because of a Thunderbolt snafu. Our inventory team didn't actually take the water block off the motherboard because that would be a bit of a hassle for me to reinstall and they did. Oh, they took the CPU out of it too. Uh, guys? Guess I'm gonna have to put the whole thing back on again. Oh. Oh, they took it apart even more than it comes apart to start with. This is gonna take me a bit. All right, so that's done. Let's go ahead and pop this bad boy in here. And, oh yeah. Uh, this board is wider than standard ATX, so I'm gonna need to move my SSDs. Ah, well, that's some good double-sided tape. I think I bent this drive. Now let's try and put the board in. All right. Just need to plug in all the fans, plug in our power, and now we need to swap out our original CPU block for this one that cools the entire board and the CPU and VRM and all that. Now I have a crazy idea. Normally, you would think, well, Linus, the best way to do that is probably to drain the whole loop, connect everything, and then refill it. But I think we can skip the draining step as long as we keep the part of the loop that we open at the highest point. Just a sec. Uh, a scissors. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna prop it up on my graphics card. I'm just gonna crack this open. I can't find my vice grips. So this is not really optimal, but, ah! So everything that's under me is waterproof, I think. Yeah, tubing, fittings, reservoir, industrial PPC fans. There, let's go ahead and undo the other side. Yeah, not much in there. Now here's the risky part. I need to keep these two level because if one goes too high, the water will go down, 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 and splurt out the other side. Oh, oh, hard to find. Oh, I think it's in. Now, let's see if this one reaches. I should just rename the channel to like, low effort water cooling tips. Ooh. Forget it. I'm just gonna get a Mac Pro. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's not actually a better solution. So these are 3200 megahertz C14. Now if Gigabyte's not impressed with what I'm doing with their high-end gaming components, I'm sure G-Skill is on a whole other level here. Let's throw the GPU back in and then we're good to go. This is really a very horrible mounting mechanism. I'm not even gonna try and screw it in this time. I don't know why I bothered. Okay, so all that's left is to fire it up and see if it still works. Oh, there's definitely water in there. Come on, baby. Ooh. Let's try giving it ye old receipt and see most clear and see if that resolves it. Hey, whoa, whoa, hey, hey, hold on. No idea what happened, but it's up. Woo! BIOS has been reset. Nice. So theoretically, all we have to do is press 5.1 gigahertz OC and it'll work. Now this will probably take a few minutes, changing chipsets. And check this shiz out, my friends. We are booted. 
Not bad. Now, neither of our network controllers have drivers here, so I'm gonna have to download those, but then we should be uh, sitting pretty, pretty quick here. All right, so while I reboot for a driver install, we're just gonna top up the water here. We did lose a little bit of water and our new block takes up a lot more of it. So let's just uh, do some precision pouring with the Linus Tech Tips water bottle. Not a supported use case for the Linus Tech Tips water bottle. That's about as full as it was before, I guess. Sick. So the purpose of what we're doing here is to ensure that we're actually getting the 5.1 gigahertz that were advertised. When the system's idle, it's not necessarily gonna be running at that speed. But let's go ahead and hit it with a heavy CPU load and see what happens. Hey, not bad. Okay then. We survived our Cinebench test. So that means the last thing for us to do is try to enable XMP, which will adjust our memory automatically to its faster speed and tighter timings. I don't have a lot of hope for this. It's a good sign. That's a good sign too. Now that we've got that dialed in, let's make sure it's not completely unstable. Do a quick Cinebench Extreme run. Eight threads at over five gigahertz, Ed. Oh yeah, and your server has RGB now. So we seem to be stable. We actually got 10 more points. Went from 568 to 578. So we're gonna go ahead and shut down Cinebench here. No, I don't wanna save it. And uh, Ed, show me where our sample project is. Why don't we do the TechLinked? Now TechLinked, even though it doesn't take that long to render, is the kind of project where the faster it goes, the nicer it is. Because it's only about 10 minutes, but because we write, shoot, and edit it all within the same day, the faster it exports, renders, and uploads, the faster everybody gets to go home. So let's go ahead and process, is it just this one right here? Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna remove this from the queue and we're gonna find out. What do you think? Think it's gonna be faster? Ooh. Did it crash? Did even the reset switch not work? That's pretty crash. Let's turn XMP off. And people wonder why I don't like XMP. It never works. All right, we've got one more trick up our sleeves. I pulled two of the sticks. I think 16 gigs of RAM should be plenty for our workload here. And we're gonna see if it's a little more stable without all the memory slots loaded up. Yep, there it is. Good, good, good. Overclocked. Running at the right frequency. All right. Let's try that sample project again. Now what's interesting is our CPU is actually only running at 4.8 gigahertz right now. I wonder if XMP is kind of screwing us here. All right guys, we are really close to results time here. So for TechLinked, our time to beat is nine minutes, 48 seconds. And it looks like we're gonna come in well under that. Let's have a look here. Come on, baby. You have got to be kidding me. Nine minutes and 19 seconds. Maybe we really did need those other two cores. So here's the situation. We only beat our score by about 30 seconds, uh, which is not the kind of improvement that we were looking for. So there's a couple factors at play here. One is that even though I don't think this is an AVX workload, it's kind of behaving like one. So our CPU turbos to 5.05 or 5.1 in Cinebench, but only hits 4.8 here, which looks like an AVX offset. So we're not getting quite the clock speed we were expecting. And two, it appears that my recollection may have been incorrect or Adobe may have updated their encoder because our CPU is getting absolutely pinned to 100% in many cases here. It may be that we actually do need more cores. So there's no way around it. We need to reevaluate here. This project has really challenged everything I thought I knew about our video export workload. So what we're gonna have to do is take things entirely back to the drawing board. And to do that, I've set up a test bench here so it's much quicker for me to swap things in and out with Intel's 18 core 7980XE with the goal being to determine, well, gee, exactly how many cores 
do we need for this? How well does it scale? So the idea here is once we know that, we can then find the fastest chip with that many cores and try this whole thing again. So based on what we're looking at here, with loads anywhere from about the 75 to 85% range on this thing, we can guess, and this will be a far from perfect guess, but we can guess that maybe something in the neighborhood of 14 cores could be the right answer. Fortunately, we have a very unique ace up our sleeve. This, courtesy of our friends over at Puget, because the only way to get this chip is through Intel's like secret special auction, is a Core i9-9990XE. It actually has fewer cores than a 9980XE at only 14 versus 18, but it turbos to five gigahertz and its base clock is four gigahertz. So why don't we give it a shot then, shall we? Got nothing else to lose, just time. Naturally, changing out the CPU necessitates another motherboard swap. So once again, this poor Aorus water-cooled board is getting pulled from a project. Not because it did a bad job, but just because it wasn't the right fit. After all this, going back to the original block, so stupid. How bad is it? It's definitely dripping a bit. Now something to be aware of guys is that while electronics and water definitely don't mix, as long as they're not powered, the likelihood of doing permanent damage is actually very low. Not very low, it's lower. Uh oh, yeah, it's leaking pretty bad this time. Okay, here we go. And... You're out of there. Beautiful. Whew. Where's that block? Yep, it's on the floor. So that goes to the inlet, and that goes to the outlet. Go ahead and cut. For the board, I'm going with a Prime X299 Deluxe. Um, not for any particular reason, other than that that's what I found on the shelf. All right, so here we go. Even though it's 14 compared to 18 cores, because of its much higher frequencies, this is a 205 watt TDP CPU. And that's assuming that's accounting for Intel's uh, optimism with respect to their TDPs. <sighs> All right, now we're ready. Blocks on, cables are routed. Let's strap it in. All right, it's reassembled. Please work, like just work. It occurs to me this is a relatively new CPU and I have no idea when this board's BIOS was last updated. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. All right, it's a good sign. Techlinked transcode.mov. And it doesn't look like it's going to be any faster at all. Curiously, our CPU usage is significantly lower than it was on the 18 core. Okay. And our time is looking like it's gonna come in just over seven minutes for the raw encode, which should put us right around the same time. So we're at 9.38, which is 10 seconds faster than our original configuration, but actually 20 seconds slower than our water-cooled overclocked 9900K but I think we can do a little better here. It occurs to me that just because XMP didn't work on that other board doesn't mean it won't work on this one because it might have been optimized for quad channel operation. So we're gonna go ahead and try again with XMP. Good luck, everyone. Well, this puppy's definitely hauling now. We're seeing turbo speeds floating right around the four gigahertz range. And that estimated time remaining looks like it might be as much as 30, 45 seconds faster than our last run. What remains to be seen is whether or not it's stable. Surprisingly, it was stable enough to finish the render. All right, good job, XMP. Hey, 850. Wow, 
So we actually crushed our original time that time. Goes to show you what more cores, more clock speed, and faster memory will do for you. Wow, that's almost by a full minute. So now that we've at least managed to make the machine faster, I think I'm gonna stop fooling around because this is two full days that the editors haven't had their transcode server, but I'm also feeling pretty inspired right now because we did manage to get better results than this with that weird 1U gigabyte overclockable server that we checked out a little while ago. So what I think is that with a better designed water cooling system, maybe a board with beefier VRMs or something along those lines, that we could push this further. I think our 500 watt power supply might actually be holding us back as well. So we're gonna leave this one here for now, but next time I'm gonna be coming back at you guys with a custom designed enclosure that's really gonna let this thing rip. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in design, business, technology, and more. And their premium membership gives you unlimited access to high quality classes on must know topics so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities in life, and do the work that you love. It's more affordable than most learning platforms out there with an annual subscription costing less than $10 a month. And it's got tons of great stuff. Like you can check out Christopher Dodd, who is a top teacher at Skillshare. He's a self-taught web developer who inspires and educates students. His classes go over the fundamentals of web development and he has over 6,500 students signed up for his courses. The first 500 of you to use the promo link in the description are going to get your first two months for free. So don't wait guys, go check out Skillshare at the link below. So thanks for watching guys. If you disliked this video, you can hit that button. But if you liked it, hit like, get subscribed, or maybe consider checking out where to buy the stuff we featured at the link in the video description. Also down there is our merch store, which has cool shirts like this one that James is wearing. It's like you're seeing double. I'm also wearing it. Yeah, lttstore.com. Uh, also our community forum, which you should definitely join.